So tonight it's gonna be uh, you, uh, me, and, and Mishi, and Epley, and Jared Pioneer. And we're gonna uh, present you the project. Technical aspects to organizational stuff, build, release, coding guidelines. We're gonna go over the entire project. So far, everything looks like usual, but duh, 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 it is not. Look what I have for you here. I have this crazy thing, which is like, what is going on here even? Um, so what we have here is actually uh, not a normal Java, sorry, Jared Pioneer stream, where I'll just be sitting here and, you know, making a fool out of myself trying to fix problems. Uh, no, this is different uh, because today we decided uh, that we want to present our project. And we, it's not just me, we is also uh, Michi who's with us today. And then there's uh, Epley or Simon and then, wait, no, damn it. <laughs> Think with the pros again. There you go. <laughs> and... Um, Michael or Michael or Bish or Bukama, he, they're all the same person. Uh, he couldn't make it. Uh, he's unfortunately not feeling well today, so I hope he gets better soon. Um, yeah, so a quick hi to you, both of you. Um, hi. But you'll see more of hi. them uh, later. Okay, so let's start. So to Jupiter and beyond, we're going on an exploratory mission with Jane at Pioneer. Uh, so Jane Pioneer, you know, you can go to janepioneer.org. What does it do? It provides extensions for Jane at 5. Specifically, it's Jupyter API, and we're going to see in a second what exactly that means. It's, it's a kind of small project. We have 10,500 lines of code. Uh, we are four maintainers. And why do I think this is interesting at all? Well, first of all, I think JNet5 is a really cool um, project, and it's really nice uh, to, be, to be working with that. And then we grew a small community on Twitch, you know, here, basically. So I think that's very interesting as well. I love talking about that. Uh, we have cool build and git practices. I really like the one-click releases that we set up and the automatic website build, which fails occasionally, but generally is really great when it works. Uh, so we're gonna have a look at that as well. Uh, yes, this is all that I'm gonna show you now. If you're interested in this, um, yeah, you can pause and check later or check now, but I'm just gonna go ahead and start working um, through the slides. So let's start with Gen 5, Gen 5 extensions in general. So let's have a crash course to Gen 5 and an extension model. And please note that this is very incomplete. Right, this is uh, just uh, like the, the crashiest of crash courses. So this is what a simple Janet 5 test looks like. Uh, right, uh, you want to have a class. There's your cl cl test class name. Uh, and the body in this case just contains the one method. Uh, it's annotated with test annotation. You will see that doesn't need, need to have to be public. That's kind of nice. There's a simple assertion. Very straightforward. That's the simplest test you can probably write. Right? And... Um, the interesting part about this is that uh, if you take a closer look at this, then specifically if you come from Janet 4, you will think that this is just one thing. Um, but as I said, if you take a closer look at it, it's actually two things. You have an API that you write tests against. This is what I've been doing here, basically. Uh, but then you also need somebody else to run them. So let's call this the engine, right? There needs to be an engine that you know understands these tests and runs them. And Janet 5 does a, uh, has a very smart split in these uh, different concerns. So first of all, there's the API to write tests against. And then the discovery and, and execution of tests, that's f split further. Uh, you have a specific engine for each variant of test. I just showed you JNN5 tests, so there's a JNN5 engine for that. Um, once again, that's actually called Jupyter. We'll see that in a second. Uh, there's one for JNN4 as well, interestingly enough. And you could come up with all kinds of test engines. Uh, there's an API that they all implement. And then there's some orchestration of these engines. And what this looks like in practice could be this, for example. So at the top, you have the test that you or I write. We write against the Jupyter API. At the very bottom, you have the tool that you want to run your tests. In the past, basically, the Jupyter API, the, 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 the thing that I have at the top there, uh, that would be the JNet4 jar. And your tool will just run that jar. And that's, that's all there is. Uh, but here, it's a bit different. So we have. Uh, the tool will, will go to the JNet platform runner and will tell it, look, somebody told me to run tests in that folder, do run tests in that folder. Uh, it will then look for implementations of this engine. In this case, we'll find the Jupyter engine um, because that's how I configured my tests. It will find my tests and uh, the, that use the Jupyter API to, um, to express themselves and will run those tests, right? So this is uh, the, the overall approach, the architecture JNet5 picked. And here you can see the name Jupyter pop up for the first time. So the Jupyter API defines this, this test API. Um, it also defines the extension API that we're going to look at now. And it contains the engine that you need to run them. And when people say JNet5, 
they often just mean the Jupiter part. There's actually more than that, um, but that's what they're mainly focused on. Okay, so how, what, how does the extension model work? Uh, Jupyter allows really seamless extensions. It's really great. Like you can write stuff like this disabled on Friday, and even though it probably should be in the official API, it's not scandal. Um, but you can write your extension, which fits in seamlessly and works like that. And there are two cornerstones to this. One of them is, or the first one is, that extensions interact with so-called extension points. And the second one is that your extension needs to be registered somehow, for example, with annotations. So let's have a look at extension points. Here's an incomplete list. You have stuff like an instance post processor. You have extension points for before all and before each. Uh, you have execution condition, which check whether text test should even be executed, exception handling in case of the test through an exception, after each and after all, there's more. And each um, extension point corresponds to an interface. So let's have a look at the execution condition extension point, which deals with, eh, which deals with should this test be executed or not? There's an interface called execution condition. And implementing that is fairly straightforward. Uh, you implement an interface, and all you have to do is implement this one method. Uh, there's an evaluate method. Um, oh, it's called evaluate, and you get some parameters that we don't even need here. And all we need to do in this case, well, we want to disable on Friday, right? So we just check whether it's Friday. And if it is, we return condition evaluation result disabled. The test will be disabled. Otherwise, we return enabled, and the test will be enabled. And that's it. But that's a very simple, probably one of the simplest extensions you can write. Um, and that works like a charm. So now we've done the first part. We interacted with these extension points to implement an extension. But how do we tell Jupyter about it? And the answer in this case, there are different answers to, uh, to this. But the most, I would say, the most widely used, because it's the most comfortable to use, are annotations. Because we can create our own annotations. And thanks to a thing called meta annotations, which is a concept that Java has, which is a bit weird and it's not too important right now. Uh, but what it essentially means is um, you can have annotations on annotations, and Jupyter will discover them. So Jupyter will see this test, because it has the Jupyter test annotation. It will find my annotation here that I declared up here. And then it will find the extend with disabled on Friday condition class. That was the extension that I just showed you. And this is how Jupyter learns about this extension. And this is how it can instantiate it, and then check for a test. Uh, it passes the information about the test to the code that I just showed you. That test will check whether it's Friday or not, and then we'll disable or enable the test accordingly. And uh, I just showed you one of our extensions, but we do have more. Uh, and for more on that, I'm going to hand you over to Michi uh, and let him go into a little bit detail on that. Have fun. OK. So yeah, what Nikolai just said, I have to disagree. He just said that he just showed you one of our extensions. Unfortunately, not even us have the Disable on Friday extension, which is a shame, really. Uh, but we have a lot of other things that I would like to show you. Uh, for ex Here's an incomplete list that you can take a look at. Um, and I will get right, to, uh, get right to it. The first one is the Cartesian product test. So JUnit 5 has this concept called parameterized test. And uh, it's a very, very straightforward. It's basically all in the name. It's a test that has parameters, because sometimes uh, you want to run your test, the same test, against different inputs. And uh, how uh, parameterized tests work is that you have to specify all your parameters. But sometimes you don't want to specify all your parameters. You just want to uh, specify the possible inputs of the, of the method that you want to run of the test. And then you want to check against all the possible combinations. And that's what Cartesian product test does. As you can see here, it's very easy to implement. And if you're familiar with uh, parameterized tests, then uh, this should look fairly uh, familiar as well. Instead of the test annotation, you annotate your test with the Cartesian product test annotation, which is our annotation. And then you specify the possible inputs with, uh, for example, the Cartesian value source annotation. Uh, in this example, it has integers 1 and 2, and then a character in string uh, a and b. And uh, this test we run four times, once for the, each of the possible input combinations, as you can see on the list below. Uh, that's basically all there is to it. Uh, we have a lot of uh, possible 
input sources, Cartesian enum source, where you can specify an enum, or uh, you can specify uh, an input uh, source uh, as a, a method as an input source, and uh, also range sources, which are also part of our extensions. And let's go on. Default locale. So uh, I'm not going to get into what locale is, but uh, sometimes your code relies on the default locale, which is which you get by calling locale get default. What this annotation does is that it uh, sets the default locale to the, your specified uh, locale. For example, in this case, this is English. Uh, it's important to know that uh, before the test runs, we save the default locale and reset it after the test has run. So this annotation is test scope. So it's it's it doesn't uh, set the default locale for the remaining tests, uh, especially because we can't uh, really know what order you run your tests in. Even if you order your tests uh, via JUnit, we don't want to impose. It's test scoped. The same thing is true for the system properties extension, uh, which uh, does something uh, similar-ish to the default locale in the sense that it sets something that gets reset after the test is run. This is for system properties instead. Uh, it's also uh, very straightforward. You clear the system property with the clear system property annotation and specifying the key of the system property. And you set it with the set system property annotation where you specify the key and the value of the system property that you want to set. OK, and uh, we have issue information. Uh, it, this, uh, this is an extension that's a bit more complicated. It lets you annotate your tests with the issue annotation. and. Uh, uh, during your test suite run, so when you execute your tests, then uh, if certain information will be collected about the, your tests that are annotated with issue. They are grouped together uh, based on the ID that you specify in the issue annotation. And uh, this information then gets passed to, um, to a service that uh, you have to implement. So we, uh, Nikolai will talk about this a bit later. And let's go on. Retrying test. This is uh, basically the first extension of JNE Pioneer. And it kind of started out as a joke because, you know, uh, sometimes you write a bad test and it doesn't succeed. So you just want to run it again and again and again until hopefully it, it uh, succeeds. You know, I could uh, talk about the definition of insanity here, but sometimes. Uh, a flaky test does need to run again. For example, what if it has to query a service that uh, on, on from the in, get data from the internet, query a service, etc. So sometimes those services or information is just not available, and you have to try again because they are too busy. For example, so there is a use case for it. So that's why we have it. It's not just a joke. Uh, and uh, we have a few others, ranges for parameters, default time zone, environment variables, etc. Uh, you can see all of uh, uh, you can find the list on the on the on the website or on GitHub. Uh, and the the common thing about these extensions is that they have nothing in common. Well, some of them do, but really nothing in common when you look at the whole picture, uh, except except one thing, which is uh, which is what Nikolai will talk about now, I think. Yes, I will. Wait, what do you mean we don't have disabled on Friday? Are you sure? <laughs> Fairly certain. Damn it. <laughs> well, I'll maybe implement that later on stream. Uh, <laughs> OK, yeah, uh, thank you, Michi. Uh, I'll take it from here. So uh, right. So with this random collection of 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 uh, extensions is isn't that just weird to just have you know have them that random? Well, it kind of is and kind of isn't. So here's the Pioneer mission statement: uh, Janet Pioneer provides extensions for Janet Five and its Jupyter API. It does not limit itself to proven ideas with wide application, but is purposely open to experiments. It aims to spin off successful and cohesive portions into sibling projects of backing through the Janet Five codebase. So basically, there's an extension out there. Let's try it out. 
if it's a great idea and it works, you know, we'll keep it. And uh, if there is more accrues around it, maybe it can at some point become its own subproject. So we want to provide helpful extensions, but we are open to experimental ideas. And we basically want to be kind of a catch all ex uh, catch all for extensions that are too small to be their own project otherwise, right? So if you have an idea, if you you know experiment with Janet 5's extension API and you put something together that you actually like and, and use or think other people could use, but you know, you don't want to go through the, all the hassle and setting up a project and you know, GitHub and releases on Maven and all of that. You know, we can take it. We can take it off your hands and maintain it. Uh, that's a typical thing that we do. So who are we? We're not talking about us. Uh, we are Matthias, uh, Mihaly, or Michi, Nikolai, and, and Simon, I think would be the German way to say it. Oh, uh, right. And uh, I, I put some 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 titles here, uh, which are not the actual titles. We don't really have titles, but they describe these describe somehow somewhat what we do. Uh, so Matthias, who well, actually I think called Michael earlier, which I'm very ashamed. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, his, his name is Matthias. Uh, he does he does issues. He does them so much that we call them issues. Uh, Michi does a lot of the development. I do whatever else is lying around and boss people around. And uh, Simon is um, doing a lot of build stuff. Uh, but really, everybody does whatever. Um, we just have our strengths that we play to. We'll see more about that later. And we have about a dozen contributors. Some of them are watching right now. Uh, and also, some of them are recurring. So uh, what do we have? We have uh, I said we have 10 lines, 10,000 lines of code. Uh, a little less than half of those are production code. Almost 6,000 6, lines are test code, which uh, so a little more than half, which I'm kind of proud of. We have 26 releases. We had five since we released 1.0. We, we require Java 8, and we have Java 9 to, wait, what do you mean? There you go, 9 to 16 is supported. Uh, so that sounds great, right? Sounds like a, you know, like, a, like a small, but still like a success. We had an idea, we started a project, and there we are. Um, but it's, it's, that's, that's not actually true. Um, this is a hobby project, and life gets in the way, and it got in the way for a couple, of a couple of times. And for three years, very little happened, actually. So this is the commit graph from, uh, uh, from GitHub. So in the beginning, it's with some, some ex experimentation, and then some excitement phase later. Then 2018, there is almost a year where nothing happened. Then we, uh, we, we finally we took off. And then there's another over a year, actually, where nothing happened, and now we're running on cruise control. I want to go a little bit into these phases to give you an idea um, of how this how this played out and how this grew very slowly. And I think this is actually representative of many projects, right? That start small and stay kind of small, um, because you know, like this is a side project. People do this on their own time. Okay, so uh, 2016, Janet Five published the first milestone builds, and I experimented with that a lot, and I thought I'd collect that stuff somewhere. So I launched something that I call Janet IO because IO is one of the first moons of Jupiter. No, oh, sorry, I think it's a, it is the largest, or it's like a volcanic moon, some moon of Jupiter. Um, and yeah, I think it's very volcanic. I called it a melting pot for all kinds of extensions. And back then it was just a demo repo, right? I just put all my Janet five demos in there so I could point to them. Um, there are Eighteen commits, about one and a half thousand lines of code, and three hundred lines of other stuff like readmes and documentation stuff like that. Because in 2017, uh, Jane5 publishes release candidates uh, in September, and things get a little bit more earnest. And then uh, Steve Moyer, who's also very active in the Jane5 project, uh, he pointed out that he thought he would roll his own extensions into a project. I thought, like, wait, I had the same idea. Let's do this together. So Steve and I got together, and uh, we joined forces, and we took basically my project, but rebranded it from IO, uh, which is a bad name because it's really hard to search for it, uh, to Pioneer. Which is um, which is uh, the first human craft that went to, to Jupiter. Uh, so that's why we uh, why I call it Pioneer. And then we turned into an actual kind of smallish project. So we had a couple of commits. We lost a couple lines of codes, which really made me wonder when I put these statistics together. I checked it out, and the reason is that uh, one of my examples was like disable on that operating system and disable on that Java version. And uh, I think independently of me, but I'm not sure, the Janet 5 team actually had the same idea. And so now those extensions were actually in Janet 5 proper. Uh, so I had to kick them out here. So we lost a couple of lines of code. We still didn't make any releases, though. And then things kind of you know, went to sleep. Uh, Steve was busy teaching. He's teaching at the university in the USA. Um, and you know, I always have more ideas and projects than I have time, and then nothing happened. 
And, you know, as is not uncommon, I felt kind of bad about this a bit. And so in May uh, 2018, the January 5 team was like, you know what? We kind of like your project. Like, but could you maybe, you know, do something with it? Uh, so they helped me get it off the ground. Um, they, so I think uh, Steve Brennan, Christian Stein, and um, Mark Philip, all three of them, I think, contributed to the uh, to the code base. We set up some stuff. We set up the releases and everything. Uh, so we get almost like a thousand, thousand lines of code, but also a bunch of other stuff, right? A bunch of configurations. Uh, we got more contributors, and we actually got real live releases. So that was when the project took off. But then once again, went to a slump. Once again, it's like I didn't have much time to spend on it. When I did, I felt kind of bad that I didn't. So really, and there were these phases in between where nothing happened, and I didn't feel good about it. Um, and then since October 2019, and in October, actually, Janet 5 team said, look, Nikolai, we need a project for these kind of like small-ish extensions that we ourselves don't know what to put because maybe we don't want to maintain them. Could you please just finally do the thing or we will have to start our own? And so I was like, no, okay, great. This time, I promise I'm going to do it. Then some magic happened. If I would have effects, you would see some sparkles and unicorn now. And since then, Pioneer uh, flies at steady, a steady pace. Uh, we have 150 commits. Uh, we merged pull requests that have been open for a long time. Uh, <laughs> we gained uh, most of the code base since then, and also a lot of the stuff that is not actually code, but you know, just other things that you need, specifically documentation, all of that. We have three maintainers, more maintainers than we used to. We have in total 15 contributors, 22 releases. So since then, it has been flying at a steady, space, a steady pace. So what was that magic? What was this, really? Uh, it was me trying this out on Twitch. This is me uh, uh, writing code. This is me failing at writing code. This is me um, just doing maintenance stuff on GitHub. And this is me even failing at that. We had some fun with stupid headwear, uh, stupid glasses. And um, yeah, so over time, a small community grew, and that was totally by accident. So in 2019, I discovered Twitch. Yes, I'm a bit late. I'm sorry. I did a few live streams in spring. Um, and then in December, I thought, like, you know what? I really enjoyed that. I want to do this regularly. And so over the course of 2020, I did about 30 Jane and Pioneer streams, which were usually between three and five hours. And what I hope to achieve with that, I hope to, you know, if I put aside once one or two evenings a week where, where I stream, and I would have every other stream be about Pioneer. Um, then the goal would be, OK, I, can have, I have it in my schedule now. So I'm going to spend some time on that. I'm going to do something that I enjoy, which is streaming, and something that I also enjoy, which would be working on Pioneer, but which I also kind of feel like I have to do now because I started it. Um, and once I actually start working regularly, it, all of that feeling about, oh, I didn't work on this for a long time, all this like, you know, these, these, these negative emotions, they just went away. I really felt happy that I was, was continuously working on this um, for a couple of hours a, uh, a month. And I thought, like, hey, well, other Java devs might join me and, you know, we might hang out and chat and we might have some good time together. So that was what I expected. What I did not expect it at all, and which was the overwhelmingly larger effect than that, uh, was that viewers got an insight into the project. People were watching this and like, hey, now I understand that a bit better. And Nikolai is struggling with something. Let me help him. Uh, in Twitch chat, and then later on GitHub. And then viewers realized, wait a moment, that, that doesn't seem so hard. Maybe you can pick up this issue. And then you know, viewers became contributors, contributors became maintainers. And that's how we ended up with a small community and a small project. It was really this live streaming um, that got us there. And uh, so we're not just doing uh, the coding together. We also have a Discord where we hang out. In November 2020, we got together to donate uh, Amazon's blood money that we got via Twitch. So we took all the sub money and we you know, made some individual donations and um, put them together. So in the end, we ended up with almost 600 euros that we gave to a uh, climate action fund and um, a, goodwill, uh, a goodwill organization that is um, concerned with bone marrow donors for cancer cases. And when the pandemic is over, we can't wait for that. We'll finally meet for some drinks. So this is more than just you know people coding together. We really became you know internet friends. You know how that works. So thanks to this to the live streaming, this became a real project. Uh, in April 2020, uh, Simon and, and Matthias became maintainers because I wanted to you know put the load on more shoulders and gave one wanted to give them uh, the freedom and the permissions essentially when we talk about in GitHub terms, uh, but the freedom and the permissions to 
um, to, you know, to actually act on the ideas and to participate in the project on, on equal terms. And then in November 2020, Mihaly joined. It took a while to convince him that uh, all of his contributions warranted making him a maintainer, making him a maintainer. And a few contributors also stopped by the stream, and everybody always has great fun when I review their pull requests. Okay, let's talk about project management a bit. Um, one important aspect of this is, and this is specifically important uh, to, to, to Matthias for when he joined, is to find a way to contribute without coding. Um, he didn't, you know, feel overly comfortable with, you know, contributing code in a way that um, that's that widely distributed. Uh, so he was looking for a way uh, to contribute without uh, without without doing that. And that that's actually really handy because once a project or once a repository turns into a project, you have to do at least some project management. I mean, it sounds like a big term, but what I mean by it is just like replying to issues, uh, stuff like that. So there are plenty of ways to contribute without coding, and I think in a sense these contributions are actually more important than code. Uh, I will come back to that later uh, in a bit more detail. So how can you contribute without coding? Well. Most obviously, you can start curating issues. You can create them, label them, replying to them, uh, closing them. So there's a bunch of stuff uh, that just goes into keeping issues clean. Uh, very important as well is prioritizing them, right? Finding out what is more important than something else, uh, organizing that so that we can, you know, just just know what we work on. Uh, pull requests also an obvious thing to do. Um, you can review them on obviously on the technical merits, but also important that are they complete? Do they remember to add the documentation? Do they remember to put themselves to a list of contributors? Um, you know, all, all these kind of details that can get lost if you just look at the code. Another important part is following up on uncomfortable tasks. Uh, I occasionally need someone with a whip behind me that reminds me that, yes, this very uncomfortable thing that I've been, you know, pushing, pushing away uh, for a couple of weeks, like maybe I should really like sit down and do that. So that helps a lot. And just like generally remembering where stuff is, what is documented, what needs updating. That's very important because I'm a big fan of documentation, but if it gets stale, it gets useless, and it drags the project uh, instead of helping it move forward. And so that's also a very important part. So this is one of my favorite issues, actually. It's such a little detail, um, but it could easily be forgotten. At some point, we decide, OK, we're going to have a 1.0 release in the future. Um, and, and, and then we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do that. And then um, uh, Matthias Bishop pointed out that well, the documentation actually says that the major version stays at zero for now. Uh, so we would obviously have to change it in documentation. And this is a great detail because uh, it's a great. I think this is a great example for for how project management can work. You might seem this. You might think this is like a like a small small aspect of it. But no, this keeps the documentation working. You have to remember to, you have to, first of all, you have to um, remember to do it. You have to know that it's important enough to actually create an issue for it and then to follow up on it. And if you don't do these small tasks, these small cleanup tasks around the project, um, soon parts of it will start to fall apart. The other part is doing the dirty work. So while coding is fun, cleaning up often isn't that much. And here's what I said, um, what I want to get back to. Um, why coding maybe isn't the most important part. Obviously, in the end, a project is not used because of the documentation or because of the website. It's used because of the code and the features that it has. But in many projects, particularly in one with like random, random collection of features like Pioneer, outside contributors will be happy to provide code and do most of the coding. Um, so while that is, of course, important for the overall project, as a maintainer, it's less important because other people can do that for you. As a maintainer, you can take a step back and you can, or kind of should, I guess, focus on the on the dirty work. Uh, focus on fixing bugs, on tackling the hard stuff. Like we spent, I think, like entire stream just figuring out how annotations work. Uh, we spent more than one stream trying to solve our threading problems, which we still didn't have haven't, uh, solved. Sometimes uh, you have you know competing pull requests, and one of them gets merged, and another pull request ends up with like a huge conflict. And if you can help that contributor by just um, removing that merge conflict so they can keep uh, contributing. That's also a big help. Uh, you know, when I set up build pipelines, releases, documentation, website, all of that. So what we decided is, that was in the beginning of 2020, all of this needs to be done. Let's create a milestone called Cleaner Pioneers for that, where we put in all of these issues. So while I try to be attentive to pull requests and everything, I really mainly focused on these kind of, of issues to get all the ugly stuff, all the dirty work behind us. 
Um, and then in spring 2020, a little a couple of weeks after we created that milestone, we started about releasing 1.0. But when do you release 1.0 for something that is just a random collection of features? There is no really a good point where you can say, okay, wait, if we have this feature set, that's a good time to release. So we decided, well, okay, if we don't have that, then a good time to release, well, we did releases before that anyway, right? Um, so 1.0 really doesn't have that much of a meaning to us. But still, it's the point where you feel like the project is mature. It's more like a psychological thing, I guess, in our case. And so we thought, okay, a good point in, a good, good point in time to release a mature project is when we have got all the dirty stuff cleaned up. So Cleanup Pioneers eventually became the 1.0 um, uh, milestone and want to release that. So everything is ready for users and contributors to just more um, seamlessly contribute to the project. So we renamed Cleanup Pioneers, or actually we extended Cleanup Pioneers with 1.0. And if you look at this list of issues, you will see stuff like uh, there's a bug like no class that found error in there. Uh, we fixed some faulty namespace creation. We have a GitHub action to manually start a release. You know, we have all these, as I mentioned, all these background tasks that are mostly in this thing. And since then, well, Pioneer still doesn't have a cohesive feature set. And, you know, all the must-dos or most of the must-dos are done. The new stuff pops up. We'll get to that later. And then you have to fix it. But there's no, like, big one milestone. Once we've done all of that, then we have the next big thing. So we don't need milestones anymore. Milestones are the wrong concept for that. So now we use, like, a Kanban kind of board with GitHub's project feature. So that's what that looks now. Uh, you know, we have a bunch of issues, and then we have basically the two important columns are to do and in progress, the two in the center. And then to the right, everything that's done, and to the left, whatever we feel should probably be the next thing that we could look at. And uh, there's stairs, and we move away from bin tray. That has been there for a while. Um, let's have a look a bit about uh, pull requests and how we work with those. Uh, so uh, the three important parts are the checklist, the approval process, and then the squash and merge that we do. So to, um, we have, a, as I mentioned earlier, um, we're focused not on just the code, but on more parts of the project. And so we, over time, we realized that a bunch of things that have to be done for pull request to really be complete, not all pull requests have to do all of these things, but most of them have to do many of these things. And you can see the checklist. And the checklist is not only there for us, it's also there for the contributor. So the contributor knows uh, what they need to do for this pull request um, um, to be accepted. And this can lead to ridiculous results where we have like at least one contributor comes to mind that would offer open pull requests that look better than mine. <laughs> they're just, they're just they're obviously the person went through the list, looked at all of these things, looked at the documentation behind them, made themselves knowledgeable about the project, and then create a pull request that while, you know, it was not technically perfect, we had some style issues, like maybe, you know, change this a bit or, but like he, he thought about all the things that needed to be done um, and um, did did all of them. Um, and we didn't like have to, you know, run behind him like that's missing and that's missing. So that's really great. That was really great feeling like people understand this and use this to offer better pull requests, which makes it easier for us, but also for the contributor, less frustration, less, oh, you still need to do that. Oh, we didn't tell you about that. So how does it work uh, once you open a pull request? Uh, we want two maintainers to approve that. And so why? Don't we trust maintainers? Don't I trust Michi or, or, or Simon or Matthias to merge that stuff? No, it's not about that. It's actually about sharing responsibility. And we'll talk a, bit, a little bit later about that. The next, the third part about pull request uh, is squashing commits. So when a pull request is ready to be merged, we take all the commits on that, on that, on that branch, we squash them into one, we uh, have a carefully crafted commit message for that, and then that commit goes onto main. So each feature appears atomically. And so the question I get then is, don't you lose the history? Don't they like, what about all the, yes, we do lose the history. That's on purpose. It's not a bug. That's the feature. Um, as a contributor that has their own pull request open, you can use commits however you like. Uh, we don't have any limitation on, you know, you don't, we don't tell you how to put you, how you put together your, your, your commits which I would otherwise start doing. Um, I really like, I'm kind of, I'm kind of like that. I like, if I like my Git history to be, uh, to be clean, but I don't want to start haggling with contributors, how they cut their commits. Some people just name commit update file X, Y, Z, and that's it. And I would not want to have that commit in my repo, but I also don't want to start fighting with contributors that I don't like their messaging, uh, like the messages that I write in, in, in Git. So, 
as I said, it's a feature. We lose the history there. It keeps the commit history clean. And that gives us also the chance to have really good commit messages and we prepare them as part of the pull request. So part of the pull request is propose a commit message. And once we think that really captures what this is about, then we merge that. And this is what this looks like. I you know, scroll to uh, some place in the commit history and just unfolded two of these commits. And you can see that they actually go to detail what this is about, what pull request this is related to, what issue this is related to. Um, you can actually really see each changing a lot of information about uh, the history of the project that way. Um, we wanted foster contributions, and we have basically like three things uh, in Petra for that. But the most important one is appreciation. I, um, I understand specifically for larger projects that can there can be some tensions between maintainers and users. Uh, luckily for us, that never happened for us. Um, but we also really try to be appreciative. If someone puts in their time, uh, not only to use the project, which I find always great when people use the code that we write, um, but also then you know take the time to think about a problem that they have, think about us, prepare a solution, or just even create an issue, and then come to us, I think that warrants to, to welcome them with a positive tone. Uh, we try, and I specifically, I fail at that often, but I still try to prioritize replying. And even if it's just to be like, thank you for a contribution. I'm sorry this is late. I got more stuff to do. I will get back to this, I promise. Um, and the last one is we want to list contributors. So every time you have a you have a pull request open, we will either the checklist will ask you or we will ask you, but you don't have to. You can add yourself to this list. And so we want to thank each individual person that's on here um, that you know this is for 2020 that contributed some code. Uh, although the maintainers they don't get their own thing. As soon as you become a maintainer, you're not on this list anymore. Well, you stay on the list. We don't remove you, but you won't get new entries to the list. So if you want to get like a, a big chunk of stuff in here, commit a whole lot uh, before becoming before I eventually um, make you a maintainer. Um, all of what I just described and much, much more is in the contribution uh, markdown, contribution guide, which describes all these aspects in detail and binds maintainers as well as contributors, right? So this go goes both ways. It's not only you as a contributor should know what you should do, but also as a maintainer, what do I expect of other people? I can't just turn around and be like, oh yeah, I want you to do this, that, and that as well, even though it's not described anywhere. That's hardly fair. So it binds both maintainers and contributors, and it grew organically over time, but it is quite large at this point. Uh, here's a partial table of contents. There's a short open source crash course uh, with some links. Uh, we describe how we organize code, and then you know how we document, how the contribution workflow works that I just described, how we handle dependencies, versioning, how we communicate. That's all in there, uh, so people can get a look at the can get to understand the project either before they contribute or while they're engaged with it. We also have some simple rules uh, that we put there that are intentionally strict, uh, so we don't want to have discussions. So, for example, we say always use SRJ. Like, yes, of course, the JN5 assertions are, are fine as well for some some use cases. But I don't want to end up in discussions like, do I think the SRJ one is better? Then I have to start convincing a contributor that it actually is better. Or maybe I'm wrong. It's like, that doesn't matter that much. Like, we just want to have um, uh, a uniform or cohesive code base. And some things are just easier if you do them all the time, even if you lose, like, maybe you know 5% of quality, because maybe in this one case, the other assertion would have been better. Never use now to encode a legal state always is optional. Always squash commits. Yes, even if you just did two commits and they're really great, let's not have this discussion. We'll just squash it anyway. Uh, we have some naming rules, apply them as well. So I think consistency is what we're striving for, but I think simplicity is the best way to get to consistency. Um, another thing that we describe in the contribution guide is how we communicate. Because we do have a bunch of different channels, right? So we have the project website, obviously, to communicate to users. Uh, there are the files in the repo, like the README and contributing uh, uh, guide. We have Git commit messages. We have issues and pull requests on GitHub. We do have a Pioneer, um, a JN Pioneer channel in Discord. We have occasional team calls. We do the Twitch streams. We have all of these, but we form a hierarchy of them. And the, the way they are described them here is from uh, is from most important to least important. So we have a clear ranking, and we, the lower on this list something happens. The more we have to work to push it up of that up that list. Basically, every time something happens, let's say on a team call, the thing we decide is okay. This goes into an issue. This has to be. This is part of the commit message. Or when we have something that goes into a commit message, if it's an important detail, maybe it should end up in the documentation on the project website, right? So we try to push stuff up this list as far as possible, as far as it makes sense, really. There's also a part here about protecting maintainers. 
Uh, there's no expectation of availability. This applies to users opening issues, contributors providing pull requests, and other maintainers. None of them can expect a maintainer to have time to reply to the request. This was something that was uh, specifically important when we extended the contributor team, uh, sorry, the maintainer team, um, because the new folks, they, uh, um, they were worried like, well, I, this is a side project for me. I have a family, I have a job. You know, I can't spend each evening replying to issues if you know, a lot of things, a lot of uh, issues should be opened. Uh, and that's right, and they shouldn't. Every, every one of us has other lives, and I found it important to actually put that in writing and be like, that's okay. You don't need to feel bad. Don't feel, I felt bad because I'm stupid like that. Don't make the same mistake. Don't feel bad. Um, if you're not always on, that's perfectly fine. Actually, that's, that's more or less expected. And uh, that was one of the struggles for, for, for the newest maintainers um, because most of them, for, this, for all of us, actually, I think it's the first real open source project. Uh, for them, the project already pre-existing, pre-existed. So there were a lot of things that I did that they would now also have to do kind of similarly, maybe. And they were worried about breaking things. So the solution that we was that we picked was okay. If you're afraid um, that that you might break something, which I didn't worry about that much, but you know, if you are, first of all, let's have uh, always have two people look at each pull request. So that way you can be a little bit feel better about merging something. That it's never just your decision. Somebody else has to say it's okay as well. But also, and this was basically in reply to this, we made, or I made myself the benevolent dictator. Um, what I mean by that, I have special privileges. I can do whatever I want. I'm like, yeah, I don't have to wait for other, for other people's approval. I think just today, I just pushed yesterday. Just yesterday, I just pushed a commit to mail without pull request, without you know, anybody signing off on it. But that also gives me a special duty where basically I still have to see everything. And if any, anything goes wrong, it's always at least partially my fault um, because I could have stopped it, right? So I write into the into the contributing ID, I bear responsibility for all mistakes, not legal responsibility, just saying, right? Um, but yeah. So um, that was basically as a stopgap to make sure that maintainers felt comfortable working in this project without worrying that at some point I might turn around and be like, you broke X, Y, Z, you shouldn't have. It's not my style. But still. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of project and team management generally involved, right? If you're a team leader, if you're working in a, well, if you're just working in a team, you, you will recognize these tasks, right? This is just the same kind of task that you will see in a, in a team working in a company with the difference that, of course, here there is no payment involved. There is no expectation of availability. There is no, uh, well, you had a week of time to, to fix this. Why didn't you? But other than that, a lot of the tasks are just similar to what project and team management does. And there are many ways to contribute without coding. And uh, if you feel like, if you're interested in an open source project uh, for whatever reason, but you feel like you're not quite up for writing code for that project, that's fine. That's a good decision to make. If you think like, I don't feel up to it, then don't, then, then don't necessarily force yourself to do it. You know, sometimes there's a value in going out of your comfort zone, but if you just don't want to, then don't. Every project, I'm pretty sure every project out there will be thankful for somebody helping them with other stuff. And not just writing code because everybody wants to do that. Start with like helping them on issue, replying. Like if you're, if you're an expert user, if you know the project well, even just helping people who come up with bugs, explain them it's not a bug, it works as, as intended. Or yeah, actually I reproduce this locally. It is actually a bug. Stuff like that is so helpful. Uh, helping them with issues and with pull requests, all the stuff I just mentioned. Uh, there are tons of ways to contribute without coding. Okay, but if you do want to do some coding after all, then uh, here's Michi telling you all about that. So let's talk about uh, let's talk a bit about our code base. Uh, I will talk about uh, these topics: architecture, dependency management, and how to test test framework. Uh, so let's let's jump into it. Architecture: Gene is pioneer as high end architecture. Uh, this is a joke because, as you can see, we have. I'm not sure if this is clear, but we have one, two, three, four, five packages. And uh, well, it's mostly just two packages because vintage, uh, those are vintage, it's just, uh, just to help you migrate from JNIT4 to JNIT5. And uh, two of them, issue and internal, are internal. So you shouldn't use anything in them. Uh, so we have. Two main packages, and there's a good reason for that. It's because we mirror Jupyter's packages. So Jupyter has two packages API for 
the standard testing stuff and then params for everything that relates to the parameterized test stuff. So that's what we do. We have Jupyter, where are most of our extensions, orgjnitpioneer.jupyter. And we have orgjnitpioneer Jupyter params where we have the extensions that relate to parameterized tests. That's, that's basically our architecture. Uh, a bit more about internal packages. Uh, so we created two, and uh, we have utilities, internal utilities that you shouldn't uh, shouldn't rely on, and uh, some internal implementations that we don't want to uh, expose. So how how do we prevent people from using them? Well, one package is called internal. That's fairly straightforward, and it's a pretty conventional way of uh, telling people not please don't use things in here. Uh, we have package info, and it says that it's internal. Please don't use it. And we ship as a modular jar. And uh, if you don't know about uh, the Java module system that came with Java 9, I'm not going to talk about that now. But uh, basically, it just means we don't expose this part of the, uh, it's not part of our public API, you can say. So uh, if you use a modular uh, Java application, you won't be able to access it from our module. And a bit more about architecture, we have uh, rules in place that uh, that makes sure that our code base uh, is easy to maintain from our architecture architectural strength standpoint as well. For example, naming classes, uh, if you implement, for example, an extension point, then you should uh, then your class name should end with extension. And if you have an annotation that you want to implement for an extension, then the name of the extension should be the name of that annotation plus extension. So for example, Cartesian product test is one of our annotations and the name of the extension that actually does the work is Cartesian product test extension. Fairly simple. Uh, organizing top level types, Peggy repeatable annotations, yes. Uh, for example, we decided early on that uh, whenever an annotation is repeatable, it has to define a container annotation. So it should be inside the interface, basically. And uh, we use Jupyter's namespace uh, in a standard way. In a uh, we have a rule for that, uh, which helps us separate uh, extensions. And uh, all of these are fairly simple. We have other rules and tools. Um, it's it's just standard stuff. You have to be uh, have to be aware of them to contribute to the project. It's it's not a big deal if you are not familiar with these rules uh, because you can just open a PR and we will tell you if there's something missing. And dependency management. What about our dependencies? Do we have a lot of dependencies? Well, no. We have one dependency, which is JUnit 5, the whole JUnit 5, because, well, it's fairly straightforward. We are an extension pack to JUnit 5, so you need to use JUnit 5 to use our extensions. That's, I think that's uh, just uh, common sense, I would say. Uh, but what about other dependencies? Like, uh, what if we want to create an HTML report or a JSON report or whatever from tests? Uh, we decided that JUnit 5 should be our only runtime dependency. So we can use anything for testing. It's fine because, you know, we, because why we don't want dependencies is that we don't want to add to end users uh, dependency hell. We don't want to pull in a lot of things and then those things pull in things and that's just a whole complicated mess. So we don't want to add to that. So let's talk a bit about the issue extension, a bit more uh, how it looks in practice. So, and it ties very well, in, uh, very nicely into uh, our external dependency problem. So basically what we uh, discussed is that uh, tests relate to requirements uh, sometimes, and you want to mark your test uh, which requirement they relate to, for example. So you can put the issue annotation there, mark it that this is uh, relating to requirement one, two, three. And then you have another test that also relates to requirement one, two, three. So you put the uh, annotation there and then other annotation on other tests. 
And uh, what the issue extension does is that it collects all the all the test information, the, the name of the test, the name of the requirement, and the outcome of the test. It collects these three informations, and it uh, puts them together nicely in a package, and then publishes it uh, to where? Well, you could publish it in an HTML or JSON or XML report, uh, but you need dependencies for that, right? For example, XML, you usually use JAXB. For JSON, there is JSON, which is the Google JSON uh, parser. Uh, we don't want to implement these standard solutions, so you need dependencies to create these reports. So what do we do? Well, uh, we use the service loader interface, uh, which uh, loads in the implementation uh, that the user provides. So we define an issue processor interface. We declare it as a service. And when the user implements this service, uh, we load it in. But basically, uh, there is a standard way of doing things. If you implement this, then your implementation will get all the information. You can process the information, publish whatever you want with, uh, for example, you can publish a JSON report, an XML report, whatever you want, and it's done. So let's talk a bit about testing. How do you test a test framework? Uh, it's, it's a weird question, right? Because you write tests and then you want to, want to test that how those tests work with our extensions, right? And I, I'm going to give it back to, to Nikolai uh, to talk about this, actually. OK, so here's the thing. Uh, as Mishi said, testing a test framework is kind of weird. Uh, uh, well, it's easy if you want to write, if you want to just, well, it's easy in simple situations where you want to cover uh, the, uh, the working case, right? So let's say you have an annotation that um, sets uh, the default locale. That's easy, right? You put the notation on your test, and within your test, you just check the, what's the default OK set. OK, great. That's simple. But what about stuff like, what if I misconfigure the notation? Do I get the right exception? Well, I can't test it within the test, because my test never gets executed if the notation, sorry, the extension around it fails. Uh, likewise, for if you set the default locale, it would be kind of nice that once the test is done running, you, you know, the original default locale was reset. I cannot test that from within the test either. So there are a bunch of cases where you cannot just write your test inside a regular test that then gets annotated with your extension. So uh, what you do instead is you end up with a bunch of test classes or a bunch of tests that use your extension, but you don't run these tests. You don't let running these tests and hand them over to, to uh, Jupyter. So you write these tests that use your extension, but you run them yourself. So you have your tests that run extensions down here. Sorry, you have your tests that have your extension down here, and then you, but you don't run them. No, sorry, but Jupyter doesn't run them. You run other tests above that Jupyter runs, and then what you do in your own test is run the tests down here and verify whether they have the correct result uh, and evaluate those results. And uh, that's kind of weird, but JDR5 uh, has really great support for that. So of course, we didn't come up with that ourselves. We use all the facilities that the uh, JDR5 team uses for that as well. Uh, so that's really great. Uh, what we did add a bit, we added a few usability methods. We added, created our own assert J style assertions uh, for these, um, for the result that we get back. So for example, this is basically, J, not basically, this is JNet. Maybe, maybe it is, no, actually, I think this is our usability method. So we say, okay, execute a test method, pick this class, and then there's, there's a method with this name. Please execute that. And what you get back is an execution result. That's uh, a class from uh, JNet Jupyter. And then we wrote our own assertions, so we can say assert the results, for example, have a single fail test, or that they fail with an exception instance of whatever. So that's the way that we test the test framework. And uh, that's, that's it's mildly, it can get mildly confusing, but it gets much worse when you add threat safety. We want all our extensions to be threat safe to the extent that they can be. So for example, um, setting, uh, setting the default locale, there's just one default locale in the system. This cannot be threat safe in the sense that you can run several threats, several tests at the same time that set different um, uh, default locales or default time zones. So what we do instead is uh, we force, because Jupyter once again has this capability, we force 
that these tests never run in parallel. They will always be serialized so that you can always have one test setting a default locale, then exiting, then the next one, the next one. And we want to test that. How do we test that? Well, we run all our tests in parallel as well. But I just told you that we have two levels of tests, right? That our own tests execute other tests. And then both of them kind of run in parallel. And that can be weird. And we show we mostly got this. But we still occasionally have builds that time out after 15 minutes. They obviously deadlocked, and we still struggle to figure out how to solve that. Mostly because we're not really had you know acting on this head on because it's terribly annoying and complex, and so we basically shy away from it. <laughs> I spent, I think, uh, one Sunday stream was like eight hours on threading, and I fixed most of the problems. And since then, we were like, I think we she also did some explorations recently. Uh, but yeah, so that's a challenge. Okay, but when, when we have everything done, the coding is done, the testing is done, uh, we should, like the merging is done, we're now sure that we have a good good code here. Then uh, we have to you know start building this, and this is where Simon comes in. Okay, thank you. So I will be talking about building and about the concepts and things we were talking about and which we wanted to uh, take into consideration. So we'll take a look at the measures we do for quality control to improve the developer experience and reduce the friction between contributors, maintainers, etc. We'll take a look at the compatibility builds we did because we want to act instead of react. Uh, then we will take a short look at our one-click releases, which should reduce the manual effort for maintainers to actually uh, create a release or publish a release. And we will also take a short look at our website build and what we do with the website build. But first of all, uh, we need to take a look at uh, our build pipeline in general. So our project uses Gradle to build uh, with the Kotlin style of flavor. I'm still not sure what's the right expression for that. Uh, we trigger each build and commit with GitHub Actions. That allows us to be just flexible and check every time what we need to uh, check every time our uh, code for failures and errors. Uh, then if everything is fine, somebody has to kick off a release build on GitHub. And this will also trigger our website build so that we have everything published in the right manner. So regarding quality control, so there are two aspects. The first one is code style. The important part here is to reduce the complexity for developers. Uh, we want to have a uniform code style because nothing is more uh, more annoying than to find a bug or something in a code style, which as in a uh, code page which is containing of different code styles. Also, we do not want to manually do this, discuss this, or enforce this. Not between maintainers, not to be between uh, contributors, etc. Because this can cause some so the so-called friction I was talking before earlier. So the best way to do this is automate it. When we automate it, we have a tool which we can use and nobody will complain that the tool wrote something which is not in uh, correctly in place, et cetera. And we have one common configuration which we can work on, we can improve to uh, and tailor to our needs. So we decided to use Spotless, which is a, one of the really great tools out there, which is not just a linter-like check style, as we also use check style, but it also lets you later with an automatic step fix your issues. So we use Spotless and CheckStyle, and this will actually break our builds in a really early stage so that the developers get fast feedback and can fix those issues regularly. This also leads to one of the uh, it's more interesting, uh, how to say, commit messages, because we have a lot of commit messages only fixing Spotless, because that's something people tend to forget to call their Gradle Spotless apply. Uh, it's really common for nearly everybody of us to uh, encounter this problem. The cool part about this is, as it is an automatization, we do not blame somebody else for a commit message to be annoying or something like that. It's more like we found a common enemy to blame. And this also ignites. On the other side, we uh, have, for our code quality, we wanted to avoid pitfalls and gotchas like unnecessary uh, conditional checks, which always evaluate to the same. Uh, we also wanted to have a high test coverage so that we can be sure when we implement a new feature or do some refactorings that other people, so that we can ensure that the quality of our, uh, of JUnit Pioneer stays the same. And we also know, so in the end, it's always the case, we know better than any tool. So we use SonarCube for that. We use SonarCube to analyze our code base, to, fi to find such cases. We also provide the check reports to there. So we have a really good overview of the state of our project. 
Furthermore, we use uh, Jacoco uh, within our Gradle build to create the code coverage, and this will be all reported to Sonocube. And there we have a really nice overview of our project state. Sonocube is also uh, really cool because it automatically integrates with GitHub Actions and provides all the information we need on Sonar Cloud, uh, on GitHub and our merge requests. The only problem regarding that, as of the, the only problem, the, the thing regarding that is sometimes we tend to ignore it because uh, we always think, sometimes we think we know better. That's also a good part regarding tools. That's something I want to highlight on the side. Uh, Sonar, Checkstyle, and Spotless are really cool tools and they provide a lot of rules. We tend to uh, to stick to those rules and we recommend everybody to stick to those rules. But if you really have to spend more hours to fix those rules that you're actually implementing something, I would rather start challenging the rules than really try to obey them in any kind of way. Yeah, regarding our compatibility where we want to act instead of react, we decided to build against a range of operating systems. So currently we only build against Mac and Linux. We used to build against Windows too, but there is our threading issue and our builds who regularly time out. Uh, furthermore, we built against a lot of uh, Java, a different Java versions. So we built against 11, wait, 8, 11, and 16. Uh, we built it as a module and not, and we uh, built against a range of JUnit versions. This allows us to early act on issues which come up. So we know when something is, will break in the future with newer versions, etc., so that we can actually act because our time is also, as Nikolai mentioned already, limited. We are not always available. But when we know beforehand, we can at least create an issue and maybe somebody is working on that. Instead, maybe uh, some uh, user of our uh, libraries, uh, of our extension library is experienced this issue and has time to wait for that. So, and we do that all with GitHub Actions. And uh, GitHub Actions in this kind of way are actually really cool and easy to configure. So you see here our main build YAML, which is actually, as it's mentioned, as, as it's named, uh, it's our main build. We have here a matrix build, which uses Java 8, 11, and not 15, 16, and currently Ubuntu and macOS for building. On the, on the below, you see our JUnit build, which is an own build matrix where we just build against different JUnit uh, versions. For example, this was the there we clearly saw that with 5.70, I think we had some kind of API issue where they uh, renamed, I think, an API which broke our build. Uh, our one-click releases are really something nice and uh, comfortable to use. So we we said releasing something with some kind of with a lot of manual steps is tedious, is erroneous. And so we said, no, we want to automate this in a way that we have uh, a simple manually dispatched workflow on GitHub Actions. So as you can see here in the build below, you see we have our own build, the release build, uh, which, has, which can be simply triggered manually with a run workflow button. This will kick off everything. So this will start our release build. It will uh, tag our commit as I here it's better deployed. It will detect the next version. It will build our artifacts. It will upload it to Bintray, although this is a problem currently and will be hopefully fixed before either today or before uh, before the next 10 days, let's say that way. It will create a tag and it will create the GitHub releases with the changelog. We use therefore shipkit uh, or we use the two new, newer shipkit plugins, uh, which generate the auto, which do the auto versioning and which is doing uh, the change log. Uh, it provides a really nice and intuitive uh, approach that the change log has really a good overview because based on the, on, based on our squashing, we have one commit uh, per, uh, per merge request. This allows us to have really a clear history and this history will be re uh, represented in our versions. We see how many commits have been in there who contributed and uh, what merge requests have been in there with all the linking to them. Yeah, and then it comes to the website build. Uh, our website build is the last step in our trigger, pulls in first all our projects where we have code stored. It will build the website with the docs. Our docs are still in, uh, in the same project uh, where the code is lying. So we, we put them together at one place because it makes no sense to open two merge requests in two different projects. They, 
it's too easy that those diverge or get forgotten, etc. So we pull in or uh, we pull in the whole project with the documentations. Uh, we build we pu uh, we build the website. We pull in the versions from the uh, from the files of our extensions, and then we build the website with GitHub Pages and with Jekyll. And it's easier, uh, so it, it, it allows us to provide all the information about our project. We see our extensions, which are available. We uh, provide the information how people can get involved, uh, what changes happen between the versions, and you will find all the documentations regarding our uh, extensions, which are in place. Here, for example, you see all our JUnit Pioneer extensions, what they are doing with a small little sentence, and how you can use them and apply them. Yeah. I think it was a little bit fast, Nicola. Well, well at least somebody was. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so yeah, thank you both, both of you, by the way, uh, uh, for your presentations. I really enjoyed that, like just watching you. Uh, that was great. Well, it sounds creepy when I say it like that. I didn't mean it creepy. 